So I'm actually excited to introduce our colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Burns. Libby is an associate professor at Colorado State University. Her research largely focuses on climate variability and change and data analysis tools to understand it. So on a personal note, her work is actually an excellent example of combining deep domain knowledge and expertise with ideas from machine learning. And, and we'll get to see some of that, which is really the theme of the workshop. And she has uh, taken on several leadership roles in the community. She leads the new US Cliver Working Group, the Emerging Data Science Tools for Climate Variability and Productivity. She, she serves on the CSM Science Steering Committee, among many others. So please join me in welcoming Libby. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And can you hear me? Thumbs up, somebody? We can. Thank you very much. And hopefully see my screen. All right, so I, as um, Aaron Dum just announced or, or introduced me, I am really an atmospheric scientist. I study climate variability and change, but um, I, I've always had a love for data analysis and obviously machine learning falls into that category. So today I wanna to talk to you about some work I've been doing with my colleague, um, Professor Randall Barnes, thinking about how we can really merge how, I th how we think as geoscientists about our data and, and some new work we've done trying to create new machine learning methods to really um, help us advance this, this, this way that, of thinking. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the concept of forecasts of opportunity, which Vipin mentioned, and I'll, I'll go over briefly again. So today I'm gonna to tell you specifically about what we call controlled abstention networks or CAMs. All right. So what, what's the, the motivation here? So the earth system is exceedingly complicated um, and it's often, at least in my world, in the atmosphere, chaotic in nature. So really making predictions is incredibly challenging. Just think about looking at your phone and figuring out what the weather is gonna be you know, next weekend if you wanna have a picnic. This is a hard problem that we've been working on as, as, as a society trying to predict the weather for a very, very long time. So, so in bold here, right, we cannot expect, at least in my, in my world, I cannot expect to ever make perfect predictions all of the time. The Earth system is just too complicated. And so instead, you know, in many ways, when we think about machine learning, we think of, or when we apply machine learning methods, we think about making perfect predictions is really what the goal is. And here I wanna challenge that concept by saying, you know, in my case, we don't think we're going to ever make perfect predictions. So let's try to focus on those predictions that we make um, when we can. So specifically, the abstention loss, and here we mean abstention as in saying, I don't know, or abstaining, um, works by incorporating uncertainty into the network's prediction. And it allows the network to identify the more confident samples and abstain, say, I don't know, on the less confident samples. Now, there are many different ways that we've been incorporating uncertainty into machine learning training for a very long time. So I don't mean to say that we are the first in any way to do this, but we're trying to put a slightly different tweak on it in the way we think about our geoscience problems. So specifically, the abstention loss is applied during the training process rather than after the fact to preferentially learn from the more confident samples. In the case of atmospheric science, you could think of it as this says preferentially learn which forecasts we might actually have a better chance of getting right than others. Okay, so the general idea here, first I wanna, come, I wanna point out the upper left-hand corner of my slide. This work is very, very heavily influenced by um, a dissertation that just came out in 2020 by Dr. Sunil um, Sulisidasan, there we go. Um, and I put those links here, so please, please take a look at that work. And I will be sharing these slides. All right, so here's the idea. First, we wanna estimate the uncertainty of each prediction during training. Um, we're going to be focusing both on classification, which is well known in the machine learning community, but also regression, which is maybe less appreciated. Um, but in, in climate science or in atmospheric science, regression is really mostly what we do. So it's very important that many of, that the, that the tools we're developing can be applied to regression problems as well. So we're gonna estimate the uncertainty for each prediction. Um, and I will talk about this more later. And then we're gonna implement a loss function that learns to identify more confident predictions and learn them better during training. Um, for classification, we have introduced a new a loss function called the not wrong loss, but today I'm really gonna be focused on the regression application since this is more new and relevant to the geoscience community. 
Um, so we're going to modify a negative log likelihood, and I'll talk more about that. And then finally, we're going to compare this new abstention loss method to um, a more baseline method that we, we would maybe use until this um, prior to this method. And what we're going to show is that the baseline methods, they um, perform very well. However, this abstention method appears to outperform the baseline for a variety of tasks that we've um, identified in geoscience. All right, so step one, adding uncertainty to regression tasks. To many people, um, I think in the computer science community, this is probably trivial or that you have many ways of doing this, but from the geoscience community, and I know many of our viewers are from the domain, um, the domain site, the, the specific domains, there we go. Um, this is not at all obvious how one might do this. Okay, so how might we do this? So let's say we have some data that looks like this. So X is on the X axis and some output Y. We want a neural network that makes a prediction and estimates the uncertainty of this data. So what we really would like is we would like it to predict some sort of say distribution of its prediction. Um, in this case, imagine that the true label here is Y, shown in the pink line, but what we want the network to do is predict this blue curve, this predicted distribution. Um, in this case, I, it's a Gaussian. And in fact, we can do this with a neural network. Um, we can predict, in this case, the median and the 80% confidence bounds quite well um, using a very simple method that I want to talk about here. And we are writing up an um, overview of this method for domain scientists. Um, that want to implement uncertainty in their uh, regression problems. Okay, so what is it we wanna do to set up this abstention network? We want a neural network that predicts, um, that makes a prediction and estimates the uncertainty or predicts um, a probability distribution. Um, and we're going to use the maximum um, likelihood estimation or the negative log likelihood. So typically when we think of regression problems, um, when we think of regression problems, we predict why, and instead, what we're going to do is we're going to make two, we're going to output two values instead, mu and sigma. These are these these additional outputs um, now represent the parameters of a local distribution. In this case, um, let's assume it's a Gaussian, and so the mean predicts the mean of the Gaussian, and sigma is that standard deviation. So we can use the negative log likelihood, where pi is a value that is obtained from the normal distribution that's predicted by the network. That is, you can imagine the network predicting, say, one of these blue curves, which is a normal distribution with the mean mu and standard deviation of sigma. And once that prediction is made, we can estimate or we can compute this p sub i value by drawing a pink line here, y sub i of the true value. And that p sub i is merely um, this probability density function at that particular value. So on the left-hand side is a case where the network is overly confident. The standard deviation is too narrow and it misses you know, that true Y. Um, in the middle, it's underconfident. It, it, the standard deviation is far too wide. And once again, this P sub I value is, is far too low. And on the right-hand side, you can imagine this is the type of prediction we'd like our network to make when it predicts the probability density function. It looks pretty good compared to the true Y value. All right, I, I'm giving all of this background because this is really what leads to our baseline approach that we're going to be comparing our abstention networks to. Specifically, imagine we put a sample into our neural network and we, uh, it outputs some predicted Gaussian, mu, and sigma. If we put many samples through our network, we're going to predict many different distributions, say these four here, for four different samples. In this case, by looking at that spread, you can say that the blue curve, the network is very certain of its prediction, whereas in the purple curve, the network is far less certain um, of, of its prediction given that larger standard deviation. So this baseline approach is to train the model and then ultimately sort the results by sigma or how certain the model is um, by that spread in its um, PDF, predicted PDF. And then the concept of our forecast of opportunity is to keep only the X percent most certain distribution. So this, this approach has already been used in the climate community to try to identify more predictable states of the climate systems than others. And we show that, and indeed, the, more, the network is more confident in cases where the weather um, uh, evolves in a more predictable fashion. 
And so it's really important to point out that this baseline method is already a very powerful tool for identifying forecasts of opportunity in data, um, especially and specifically for regression tasks as opposed to classification. Okay, now what about abstention during training? I said the whole point of this was to abstain for the network to be able to say, I don't know on certain samples. So I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but specifically our abstention, lo or our, our abstention loss is very similar for both classification and regression. Um, and the way to think about it is it's a regression loss, that's a modified log loss as I already showed, but it's weighted by a prediction weight that is determined by this predicted uncertainty sigma. Um, so, so if you will, our loss function for a particular sample xi can be written in the following way, where you see um, here that log p appearing again, but it's weighted by this qi term that is a prediction weight that comes from some scaling of this uncertainty in sigma. Now, if that's the only term that you have, the network will quickly learn that it should say, I don't know on everything, and it will minimize the loss. So we also have a second term here that controls the amount of abstention. Um, and this alpha allows us to either um, choose what that abstention is. That is, we want the network to predict, say, uh, only throw out 20% of the samples or predict 80%. Or we can also um, train the network to um, predict the best abstention fraction. That is to actually predict um, the amount that is preferential to abstain on and, and to keep. All right, so this is where we sort of started from, again, my simple um, geoscience background. I thought, well, what, what if I had data, a data set that looks something like this, where 80% of the samples were in some cloud over here on the right-hand side of the image, and only 20% of the data fell along a clean line. Now, as a scientist, I would look at this, and I would say, oh, well, half of, a bunch of the data is really noisy, but there's this really nice behavior for 20% of the data. And so I should draw a line through that data alone. And this is this concept of forecast of opportunity again, that many of our samples are just relatively unpredictable, but hidden inside of all of that, all that climate noise is a signal that might be predictable for some samples. So when we, use the abstention network with for regression to predict, so to feed it all this data and learn the relationships that the um, abstention network learns to only predict 20% of the samples on average. And indeed it's the 20% that lie along that nice line. And it throws out the samples that fall above about X equals two because it's noisy. And it learns that that noise is, is it should abstain on. Okay, so the, another way to say this, how does this uh, compare to our baseline method where we retain only um, the, the, say, 20% most, most confident samples? Um, and what I show here is coverage or the percent of the samples actually predicted that is not abstained are on the x-axis, and the mean absolute error of those predicted samples is on the y-axis. The per solid purple line here is our baseline approach for many different abstention frac fractions or coverages. And the big point is, first of all, even with this baseline approach, as we um, throw out fewer or more and more of the samples, that is, as we retain um, the most confident samples, the mean absolute error goes down, which makes sense. The network does a better and better job. However, the more important part here is that if we look at what the abstention network does, um, that's shown in these orange dots here, it learns to only um, retain uh, 20 percent of the data or abstain on 80 percent and it outperforms the baseline method in its error. Now this is a pretty silly example. I just did XY data. As a scientist we could look at this and draw the line. We didn't need machine learning to, do, to help us do this. So let's go on to a more complex example. Specifically I'm going to use a data set that was developed as part of this um, the KGML project by Dr. Antonius Mamalakis who is advised by Dr. Emma Ebert Uphoff um, and myself here at CSU. And so what he's done is he's created a synthetic climate data set where the samples or the inputs are maps of synthetic sea surface temperatures that have nice behavior the way um, and, and correlation, uh, spatial correlations the way sea surface temperatures actually do. And their labels or their Y values are 
created as a nonlinear function f that maps each of these x these x's onto the scalar y. Um, you can think of it as some sort of nonlinear weighted sum of the sea surface temperatures over the globe. Now, the behavior of f is not important other than for you to know that we know what f is because you know Antonius um, designed it himself. So we know the right answer. We know how this data was created. So what we're going to do is we're going to task the network to predict the value y for each input map of these sea surface temperature maps. But instead of just predicting y, we're actually going to have it once again predict mu and sigma, so the, the parameters of a Gaussian distribution. Now, this alone doesn't have anything to do with abstention because we know there is a nice relationship between every map and its output. However, what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to actually mess with the data a little bit, the way sort of chaos, if you will, in the climate system messes with our data. That is what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to look over the El Nino region, that is the tropical um, Eastern Pacific Ocean. And in samples where that region um, has a value on average greater than 0.5, we're gonna leave those samples untouched. Otherwise, we are going to shuffle all of the data. That is, we're going to break the relationship between a map and its output. The idea here is once again, this forecast of opportunity that only samples with strong El Nino signals will have a learnable relationship with their labels. All other samples have been completely shuffled. Now we can do this both with our baseline approach and with um, our abstention network for regression. And once again, this is what we get. Um, so the coverage or how the percentage of samples that the network chooses to make a prediction on versus the mean absolute error. The purple and the purple shading denote the baseline approach over many, many different networks. And the colored dots are the abstention network for various abstention fractions that we have set. And the point here is, first of all, the, the abstention network outperforms the baseline approach on average, but it, it does a much, much better job than the baseline that is a much lower error um, when the coverage is right around the right percentage of how many samples in the original data set um, were worth predicting. That is about 30, 20 to 30%. So this shows how the substantial network is helping us identify these forecasts of opportunity within our data set. Now, I've just shown one particular example how we can shuffle the labels, um, but there are other ways of adding noise to the data. Um, for example, specific labels can be corrupted. So structured noise, I've shown our, we can have arbitrary label noise. Another example is corrupted inputs, where we can use the abstention network as a data cleaner. For example, imagine our sea surface temperature map originally looked like this, A, on the left, but it was corrupted. Let's say certain pixels just got a value of minus four or minus three, as shown in blue. The abstention network can actually learn to ignore these samples and, and thus learn the true relationships better on the non-corrupted samples. And so again, showing that these dots are out um, the, for the abstention network have a lower error than a baseline approach. So if you're interested, um, we have our papers on these controlled abstention networks for both classification and regression up on archive. And they are both currently under review um, in James, which is an atmospheric science journal. Um, the code is also up on GitHub, both again, the classification and regression code, if you are interested in playing with it. Okay, so some take home ideas for the domain scientists. Um, predicting the local parameters of a probability distribution is a simple way to add uncertainty for regression tasks, which is something that many of us deal with every day. And the abstention loss for regression classification really allows the network to identify these opportunities for skillful prediction. I framed it in terms of climate and atmospheric science applications, but I wanna be clear that it, it doesn't have to be a forecasting weather problem. Really any data set where you think that there are relationships hidden amongst a lot of noise, or put another way, where you think only specific samples have an opportunity for skillful prediction, the abstention um, approach may be useful for you. And then finally, um, I, I didn't, hammer too hard about this, but implementation of abstention loss is really straightforward and just involves changing the number of outputs that you're predicting and the loss function. What that means is it can be applied to a wide variety of network architectures, um, not just in this, as we did here, say feed forward networks. And with that, um, I will point out that um, my slides will be shared and I have some citations here. 
but I can take any questions that may have come up. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Livy. That, that was an exciting talk. Um, there are some questions. Um, so I, I, I'm going to pass on some of these questions to you. I have a couple of questions myself. Maybe I'll start with the ones that are on Slido. So one question says, uh, how do you handle the case where the model is wrong with great confidence? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the goal is to train a model that is not wrong with great confidence, right? That's the ultimate goal. Um, in the examples I've shown here, we, we are able to quantify and show, since we know the right answer, we're able to show that the model confidence scales very well with, with how often, if you will, it's wrong or, or, or it's that probability distribution. I think the bigger concern is that in data where you don't know the right answer, how do you know that that's actually occurring. And I, I think there are some th there are some methods out there. Here we use um, negative log loss, but there are other loss functions that can help ensure that the, the confidence scales with say how often it's wrong or how often it's right. Um, but I, do, I, I don't think unfortunately that I have an easy, easy answer for that. I think that's one of the holy grails of, of um, predicting you know, uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that actually your response reminds me of this notion of calibrated forecast where, you know, which has people have studied for, for a while. Okay, so that's the direction this kind of research can go and benefit from. Yes. So, so next question, uh, if you repeat the abstination experiment for ENSO, but set the uncorrupted fraction to 50% or so, do you get a U shape in the error for the abstination network? Uh, it's not, I'm not, it's not a U shape. Um, if, so we played around. So here I have it be about 30% um, for, for the uncorrupted fraction. But if you change that uncorrupted fraction, um, what, it, what it changes though, is that it does the best compared to the baseline in that middle 50%. Ah, that's what you mean by U. It's not a U it's, because it can still start then selecting the best of the best. So which were the easiest ones to learn? as you continue to have a lower coverage, but it does outperform the baseline the best at that 50% level. Um, I see, so uh, more questions. So, so let's see, uh, uh, if you repeat the abstention experiment for, I think it's a follow-up, if you repeat yeah. the abstention experiment for ENSO, but set the uncorrupted fraction to 0%, does your method correctly say there are no, uh, no cases to abstain? So in this case, actually, I, I'll push back. Um, this is a great question. I'll push back, back on the concept of does it correctly say there are no cases to abstain? So the, I'm going to push back a little for two reasons. One, I've, in, I've intentionally trained a relatively simple network. I didn't go into the details here, as we would in geoscience, where we don't have a ton of samples. So we don't have a lot of samples, and we don't have a complex network. What this means is there are still going to be some predictions that the network finds easier than others because this particular nonlinear function that, that created our synthetic data set um, has certain samples that are easier to predict than others. So in that sense, the network still will identify the particular samples that it knows it will get right versus those that say it waffles around zero. Um, so in that sense, no, it doesn't say I'm never going to abstain. It will start to select the ones that are easiest to predict, which is why I think it's useful to be able to set the abstention fraction yourself as a user, if you prefer. Actually, there is, it's, this is great. Uh, so there's, a, there's another question, Libby. In regions of absentia in the predictions, what opportunities exist for developing new mechanistic models? Right. Okay. So, so what we've done, um, and or what we've been doing in my group is is linking back to something Vimpin mentioned in his opening remarks was about explainable AI. So that is once you have a network that has said, you know, this twenty percent of your samples was way easier to predict. Um, sorry, this is in regions of abstentia. Oh, I was okay. Well, I'm going to finish what I'm saying and then I'll move back. So in regions where it was easy to predict. You can actually use explainable AI potentially to go back and try to understand what about the input made this an easier problem or what about the output made this an easier problem. And in doing so, we are actually using this to identify um, physical mechanisms in the climate system that maybe we didn't appreciate um, led to predictable behavior. In this case, this is asking in regions of, a, of when it abstains. So one, of the, um, one can do the same approach and ask, 
using explainable AI, why did the network think that this would be a hard problem to predict? Where did, you know, where is that noise coming from? I will say a downside, however, is it's putting all of the hard or abstained samples into one, you know, into one bucket, if you will. And so there could be multiple reasons for why the network is abstaining on a different set of samples. And so pulling those out to try and say, develop new mechanistic models could be tricky because there could be five different necessary models hidden within there. And so I don't have a great answer for that other than I think this is this is what our job as scientists is, is to take what, you know, say a method like this machine learning approach and now do science with it. Great. Uh, I actually have a question, Libby, which is probably a bit more general in scope. Uh, uh, so there are these deep generative models that people have been playing with for, for, uh, for the past, you know, six, seven years, they have been very active. They do pretty amazing things in terms of generating samples, which look realistic but uh, they are very bad at getting the uncertainty right. I mean, there, there are papers starting to come out. Exp exp so do you think this approach may help improve the, uh, the deep generative models, you know, including VAEs, normalizing flows, GANs, there's a whole bunch of different approaches in there that they can learn from in order to calibrate the uncertainties better? I, I, this is a more general yeah. question, but sure. you know, it's quite exciting. Um, so you, you know more about that world than I do. I, I will say even the baseline approach of just having, you know, uh, of, of taking a regression problem from being sort of deterministic and to being probabilistic alone would likely get those a certain distance. I, 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 while I think the Kennedy abstention networks, I, we have some nice examples showing that it just outperforms the baseline. I want to stress, I think the baseline is pretty good compared to what we were in my community were doing before. So I'm not sure, you know, if, if, if the community that's doing these generative, you know, modeling are already considering sort of that more baseline approach, then maybe this will give it a little bit of a leg forward, but I'm not I, I don't know how big of a jump it will actually be if they're already incorporating, you know, um, some of this this simpler stuff. Um, I think to me, where this really shines is it think is, is it is it looks at the data set the way someone like me as a domain scientist looks at the data, which is really saying, I don't expect my us to ever make a perfect prediction. Why am I training my machine learning method to make a perfect prediction every time? And, and I think that's maybe where the biggest benefit is of this, is, is, is changing that mindset a little bit, I think might take us somewhere. Yeah, great. Thanks. I have more questions for you, Libby, but I want to quickly make an announcement that uh, we, we have a slight change in schedule. Um, uh, uh, so uh, our next speaker will be Jordan Reed. Uh, so we are moving him up. Uh, there was a scheduling conflict. Um, so we will, you know, we, after we are done with the Q&A, uh, we, we, uh, we will have Jordan start. Uh, so just so, so the attendees know that there's a, there's a slight change in the schedule. I'll actually go back to the questions. Libby, there are actually more questions <laughs> coming your way. Um, uh, so what are the, some of the applications of the, of the CAN? Has it been applied to other phenomena other than ENSO? Um, great, so this is work, I mean, we. Work is still in review. We, we finished it about three months ago. So the short answer is no. The longer answer is um, I have multiple members of my group starting to apply this to different predictability problems in earth science or in climate science, for example, um, sub-seasonal predictions. So how do we use the information in the tropics, for example, to predict weather over the United States in the coming weeks? We're using it to look at decadal predictability. How can we use information from the ocean to understand how, um, say, precipitation patterns might change in the coming years? Um, but again, those are forecasting type applications. I really think this can be used even beyond phenomena, just any data set that has noise and a signal buried somewhere within it, this might be useful. Um, but there, I don't have anything published because we're only just started this in the last two months. All right, great. I, I uh, want to do a time check. There are more questions maybe for you, but I, I think we'll move on to the next speaker. So Ime, do you want to introduce Jordan? Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Libby.